live with. And God's not making a stink out of it, but we do. Satan did. Oh my God, I'm so inferior to you. There's nothing I can do. Here I am superior to everybody else, and that and 25 cents is going to buy me what? I can't do anything for you. So, you know, that gnaws at you day after day after day after day after day. Same problem exists when you have a marriage where one person is really talented and the other one isn't. One person is really healthy and the other one's sick. One person is really wealthy and the other one's poor. Any kind of social differential like that gnaws away at the conscience. Especially if you love. Because the last thing you want to be is a burden to somebody else. And the last thing you want to be is unable to serve, to benefit. Okay, but honey, it's a one-way street with God. God's answer is high. Yeah, so what if you're inferior? I'll pour myself into you. That's what he said to Adam and the woman in the garden. But see, Satan couldn't take it when he said it to Satan first. You'll pour yourself into me, fine. And it's always you doing the doing. I don't get to do anything for you. I can't do anything for you. See, it was supposed to comfort him that God was going to make up the differential. And they would have this sort of pas de deux, intimate relationship, by means of God doing the pouring in. And Satan doesn't have to work for it. He just receives. Okay, but there's the tension when you love somebody you want to do for them and what God's saying to all of us and him first hi this is what I want you to do for me I don't need your Petrix let's have intimacy instead okay fine but the intimacy is kind of crushing because you are constant how do you learn to be comfortable with the fact that you're a putz compared to God I mean even if you never sin you're not infinitely perfect. There's not a thing you can do for God, even if totally perfect. Your perfection is limited, and your perfection comes from God. What can you do? Nothing. Okay, but that's not what he wants. See, and that was the kind of tension that Satan had. You know, this is like pre-human race. Pre-fall. Pre-Satan's own fall. He can't live with that. You're so superior. I'm so inferior. I'm superior to everybody else, but it's doing me no good. I can't do anything for you. I can be a father to them, but to you, I'm, I, I'm not even a rock on a planet. So, in order to resolve that tension, it ate and ate and ate and ate away at him. Just like it did in the woman in the garden. You know, later on. It ate away at him until one day he had to tell himself that somehow his inferiority wasn't really true. That somehow God was the one who was inferior. And that's where you get Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. I will make myself like the Most High. See, in order to resolve the discomfort of being forever inferior and just accepting, hey, God loves me, you want to pour money on me? Fine, do it. It displeases Him. Accepting the fact that that pleases God to do that to you. It, it's like I can't do anything. Anything God gave him would not make him happy. It would, in Satan's mind, it came to just remind him of how inferior he was. And so one day he finally couldn't live with that truth anymore. Couldn't enjoy what he was getting. And all his superiority over the other angels, that, that just made it worse. We all know people who are like this. No matter what you give them, it makes their life worse. 
because they're fundamentally upset about themselves, inside themselves, and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. That's what the point he reached. And so one day, he finally had to deny the truth of his inferiority in order to make peace with himself. And now suddenly, instead of him being the one who's inferior, defense mechanism of projection, take your own perceived or real flaw and throw it on somebody else so you don't have it anymore. He's suddenly saying, God is the one who's inferior. And therefore, I will make myself like the Most High. You see where the temptation in the garden comes from? The temptation he gives to the woman is the same as the temptation he himself failed. God is withholding something from you. God is afraid that if you eat this fruit, you'll be as good as him. Well, she was already feeling her inferiority complex, too. She had God and Adam over her. So it's kind of a no-brainer. And she knew that the fruit didn't have any magical power in it. But it was a way to say no. It's the only way she had. So she took it. Of course, the minute she took it, she found out how much, you know, more inferior she really was. Because, of course, she became immediately much more inferior than she was the minute before she ate. And then Adam, he couldn't live without her, so he took it too. And we've all been playing that same game ever since. So you see, this whole spiritual life is all in your head. It's an extreme battleground. It's every second on the second that you've got to be fighting. It's very wearing. And above all, you're struggling with the fact he's big, he's God, he loves me, I love him, and I can't do a doggone thing. It's just the opposite of the good deeds mantra. It throws the whole good deeds thing completely out. And at this stage in the game, you're very well aware of. There's, it wouldn't matter how good you were. It wouldn't matter if you never sinned in your entire life. There's not a thing you can give to Christ that's worthy of him. And even if there was, you would call it unworthy because you're totally in love with him and nothing's good enough for him. So now... Do you project your own attitude about you can't can't do anything for him onto him and blame him for it like Satan did? And of course you go through the first stage of being all anal about how inferior you are. See, the whole game is very different. The God my the God deeds accomplishment has a very different playing field. It's all about truffle. Can you stay the course? Because the more you learn Bible, the more you live and learn on Bible, the more you'll realize how inferior everything is, and especially yourself. That's what Paul's talking about in Romans 7. Well, here I am this way, and I know this is good. How come I don't obey it? That's a sort of Jewish reasoning process, very cultural Jewish. How come I don't obey it already? Here I am. I know this is good. I know this is right. This is Torah. How come I don't obey it already? What's wrong with me? Oi! See? And to live with that day in and day out is like Chinese water torture, baby. And and you have to deal with it from a doctrinal basis. You know, that's my my favorite verse that he that he calls to my mind the most is that Isaiah fifty four one. Sterile, barren kids. Okay, God, you're making good on me. I know you are. That's how I get through the day. Seriously, I can't stand myself. I can't stand this life. I can't stand anything. Everything ticks me off. Cause he's God. He's gorgeous, and nothing measures up. There's nothing I can do that's good enough for him. Nothing I do counts. That's a fact. There's, there's no getting around it. And I'm constantly tempted to think that my own anal valuation of my inferiority 
It's God's attitude toward me. But it's not. It doesn't matter if I make a bazillion videos about the Bible. Or however smart I seem to be. I got all that from him in the first place. And it's a pleasure to do in the second. I really enjoy this stuff. But you know, for all that, he doesn't love me more than he loves an axe murderer. And he loves everybody just as much as he loves Christ. Because God's love is a constant. He doesn't love any one thing or person less or more. It's all one level. Absolutely. Now the way he's going to express it is going to vary based on the object because the object has a certain capacity to receive. And that's why you need Bible the most. The more Bible you get in your head, the more you learn and live on Bible, the more capacity you'll have to receive. That's what Satan wasn't doing. He was cherry-picking the doctrines. And when it came to this high divergence, this high, low, high, high compared to the other angels, low compared to God, you know, he's easily enough grasping grace down to the subordinates, very parental, very messianic. But grace up from God to him, that wasn't so easy to accept. It's really hard to switch gears. On the one hand, you're better than everybody else on the other hand you're nothing it's hard to live with those two things juxtaposed to join them but God's all about high-low joining so at this stage in the game you're going through the same thing Satan went through you're going through the same thing Christ went through and if ever anybody was superior it's Christ superior in every way and it's easy when you're superior to throw down your life for the inferior. That's very parental. Easy to be a parent. I mean, it's not easy, but it's easier than simultaneously being higher than everybody and yet considering yourself, like Christ said, I'm a worm, not a man. That's Psalm 22. I think it's Psalm 22, 6. It just flew into my head. How do you be comfortable with that? I mean, you have to understand, this is where he's coming from on it. Everything that Christ did for Father, he didn't do on his own power. Or he did it using moments of his power per Father's direction. And no amount of anything Father would have asked to him would have been enough. He doesn't feel like he sacrificed. Hebrews 12, 2 tells you that. It was an outlet. He needed it. The tension of wanting to do for Father was just a killer. He needed the cross as an outlet. That tells you that all of his life that he lived here, that was harder than the cross. The cross was an outlet. That's what Hebrews 12, 2 tells you. It was an outlet to relieve the tension. And he told the apostles that. Oh, I'm so glad Passover's here. I've longed for this day. All of his life, training for it, was harder than the actual cross. So what do you think's happening to you and me? Uh, granted, our crosses are smaller. But the training we're going through is greater than the crosses. The crosses that we come to at this stage in our life, and they're sort of like little ones, and they repeat, and then they get bigger. Kind of like when you're training in athletics. You are exercise an hour a day, then you try to get to two hours, then you try to get to three and four and five. Or like a soldier in training, you wear a 50-pound pack, then you learn to wear a 100-pound pack, and you learn to wear it longer. So that when you go out in the actual field... What you're actually going to be wearing and doing is easier than the training you got. Otherwise, your training was no good. 
So you're in training for crosses. And at this last stage, that's what you go through. And it's a relief to have them. Your life is a total slog. Your life is a total mess. It's total command pressure on the inside. Everything you ever wanted and everything you never wanted starts hitting you all at once. In sort of staggered things. And you'll fail all the time. So then God will ease up and wait and give you the test again. Meanwhile, you come to know you're in the docket. And you're being tested just like Satan was. And he flunked. And you're not flunking yet. So he and his demon boys are going to make sure that you get some extra help to flunk. And God will stand by and let it happen. See what you got to look forward to? So this is the God deeds mindset you got to get to in order to survive. And if you even get this far, you're in a very rare atmosphere. Okay? I mean, I don't know, could there maybe have been 10,000 Christians in history who've been here? And of those, I don't know, 100 or less actually finished the course like Paul? I mean, I don't know, maybe 100 is... I, I don't know, but it's really rare. And the reason we know it's really rare is that history has been kind of brutal for the last 2,000 years. See, the more people who actually super mature in Christ during the same 490 period, the nicer history is. We haven't had too many nice periods in history. Closest thing you could say was during the aftermath of World War II. From, you know, the 19, 1950s, 1960s. That was about the best period for everybody on earth that had been in a long time. You know, I'm sure there were other periods that were good also. But I'm really not sure how to compare, you know, periods that people praise like, you know, the Renaissance. I'm not so sure how good that was. The Reformation, that was pretty bad. But there was a sort of worldwide, I don't know what, what you want to call it. There was a sort of grace attitude on the part of a whole lot of people during the 1950s. And then it soured because of prejudice by the 1960s. So we didn't have but like 10 years of worldwide kind of grace orientation around the world. And even that was short-lived. I'm not sure when to say there was another good period in human history since the cross. If you can think of one, uh, you know, let me know. Because there's a way to correlate it with Bible study, historically. But you see, you're in a very rare atmosphere if you can get here. And if you get here, it's a slug. Because you're torn apart on the inside. You hate yourself. Everything else is substandard. You're superior to a whole bunch of people inside your head and you know it. You have to know it or the tension, the test won't be valid. You know you're in the docket, you can't handle that either. So for all of your superiority, you're nothing. And nothing you do in your own mind is good enough for God, even when you're between sins. Even when you know it counts. It's not good enough because you're totally in love with them. So, notice how you're not getting any of the satisfactions that come with a good deeds lifestyle. First of all, no matter how good the deeds are, they're not good enough in your mind. So you're not getting any satisfaction there. You can't pat yourself on the back and you don't want to. If anything, you're disgusted with yourself because you're always finding flaws in what you do. And since whatever good got done, got done by God using you to do it. On the one hand, that's kind of a relief because you know it's real good and it really counts. On the other hand, 
On the other hand, since it's God who really does it, your sin nature's ego can't be satisfied. So it goes hungry. See? None of this is catering to the good deeds mindset. It's going against it. And the actual lifestyle you live is a destabilizing combination of unwarranted prosperity, knowing God being the number one unwarranted prosperity. But you'll have material prosperities that you shouldn't get too. The, the unwarranted prosperity and the unwarranted adversity getting more and more closer together like a woman's contraction in labor. Because God's getting ready to birth you into kingship. That's the whole goal. Your whole life down here is just a pregnancy. That's um, Romans 8.11 to the end of the chapter. So it says travail in the King James Version. Paul's talking about pregnancy labor. He's always talking about pregnancy. That just happens to be where he's talking about it there. And you live on God's going to cause everything together for good. God's bringing it together. Isaiah 54 1. You're making something good out of me, aren't you? Yeah. See? Faith, hope, love. 1 Corinthians 13. I've gotten past the faith thing. But yeah, believe doctrine. Who wouldn't do that? Hope? Well, that's confidence in doctrine. Who wouldn't do that? Love? Oh, boy. That's a whole other kettle of fish. But that's the kettle of fish that you live on. And the way you live on it is you're doing it you're making this work you're going to be pleased with the work you're doing here in this soul because I'm sure not pleased with me but you are you say so I'm living on it Isaiah 54 1 that's the God deeds mindset 